Orchestra Director at Cedar Crest High School. I'm very happy to see you all today. Our 1030 session today um, will be conducted by Mr. Will Curry. Will is a graduate of Hershey High School and Northwestern University. He is a violist, violinist, conductor, teacher, and orchestrator. Recently, he was the music director and conductor of the National Tour of Miss Saigon. And Will has previously performed with the Broadway productions of My Fair Lady, Miss Saigon, Fiddler on the Roof, and Les Mis. Welcome, Mr. Curry. The floor is all yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I guess uh, I'll start a little bit this morning uh, chatting about my my background uh, and uh, where I grew up, uh, what I studied in high school, sort of how I got to Broadway. Um, and then we can talk a little bit about uh, my specific Broadway journey and how all those shows sort of led to one another. Um, I've got some time sort of built in that we can chat about sort of how Broadway pits work you know, how it, how it works to get into a pit orchestra, how the dress code works, how subbing works, how, because it's a little bit of a different world. Um, so sort of chatting about how all of that happens. Um, and then um, discussing a little bit about sort of what my role as a conductor is based on, and how it differs from what my role as a violist um, is on a show. And sort of how I um, manage sort of switching back and forth between those two. Um, and then definitely want to open the floor for questions. So as things come up, you know, jot them down, take note. Uh, I guess you can pop them in the chat too. I'm not good at noticing the chat, but I'll, I'll open the floor up at some point for questions because um, I really do want to be able to um, let you guys sort of pick my brain about how musical theater uh, works from the music from the music department perspective. Um, and then if there's some time left over, I have a few excerpts from shows and I can play a few things if you want. Um, remember, I, I played the viola part in the show, so you're going to get a lot of, um, you know, counter melodies and offbeats, uh, but uh, have that lined up as well. Um, great. So I am um, a graduate of Hershey High School. Um, I graduated in 2006, uh, which I think is like when some of you were born, which is wild. Um, but I graduated in 2006. I uh, did, I really did like all of the musical ensembles possible in school. Yeah, I was in the band. I actually, Dr. Campbell was my trumpet teacher in high school. I, I played trumpet, I played the viola, I played the violin, I sang in the choirs, I was in the marching band. I, if there was a musical ensemble at school, I did it. Um, and, you know, I think when I was in high school, especially when I started to go to college after that, I felt like I had kind of spread myself thin and I was really worried that because I hadn't really just focused on my string playing that I was going to really be at a disadvantage. And I went to Northwestern in Chicago for my undergrad and um, truly was the, the bottom of the studio when I got there, but um, learned very quickly that my experience doing um, all of these different ensembles doing jazz band doing marching band doing all of these things that were unrelated seemingly unrelated to viola actually were really to my advantage as a musical theater player um but it was i definitely realized i had a lot of catching up to do um so i went to northwestern uh, on viola i studied with roland vamos at northwestern um and uh but I, I really got to Northwestern knowing that I wanted to be a conductor as well. I had gone to the Pennsylvania Governor's School, um, which I'm very sad no longer exists. Um, I had gone to Pennsylvania Governor's School for the Arts uh, in 2005 and discovered conducting there and really, really fell in love with it. Um, and went to Northwestern being like, I know that I absolutely want to be a conductor, but I really needed, you know, experience as a string player. Um, and I really had my like sights set on the conducting thing really hard. Um, and, you know, my time at, I, at Northwestern did a lot of musical theater as, a, as well as a lot of classical music. You know, I was in a very serious string quartet. You know, I did all of the orchestra opera stuff at Northwestern, but I was doing a lot of student theater on the side and started getting involved conducting shows there at Northwestern. And through Northwestern got connected with the pre-Broadway production of The Addams Family. Um, we can talk a little bit later about how like what the pipeline looks like for a Broadway show. Cause it's not, people don't just decide sometimes, but very rarely are people like, you know what? I want to make a Broadway show of this musical and we're going to put it on Broadway in a week. You know, we're going to put it on Broadway in a year. I mean, we're talking like a multi-year process that often involves other productions around the world or around the country before it hits New York. So this was the last step for the Adams family before they moved to New York. Um, and they did this production in Chicago and I was like the coffee boy. I was like the intern, you know, unpaid. And I literally would go to class from eight o'clock in the morning till four in the afternoon, get in my car and drive downtown and be at the theater from four till midnight. And like do my homework in the theater 
and then come home and like repeat that whole process the next day. I did that for an entire fall, which was wild and amazing because I was getting connected with a bunch of New York folks. Um, but when I graduated Northwestern, I was like, ah, too much viola, I'm done. Um, and don't worry, there's a happy ending to the story. Uh, I was like really just burnt out on the viola. You know, it was the like hours a day I had spent playing Shraddock in the practice room and not feeling like I belonged as a classical musician because I love musical theater. And just, there were so many things like in my brain at that point. And I was like, I'm gonna be a conductor. No viola, we're done. So I got into Northwestern's master's program as a conductor. And then the summer before I was supposed to start school, got the job on Les Mis really out of the blue. I had worked with an orchestrator at Northwestern. Um, the orchestrator is the person who takes the, so most times, um, most musical theater scores are written as a piano vocal score. So it's a, the composer is a pianist, they write the piano vocal part, and then they give it to an orchestrator and an arranger who flushes it out for the entire ensemble. So the orchestrator on this show, big time Broadway guy, um, had orchestrated the Wicked tours, I didn't know this, had orchestrated the Les Mis tour. Um, and I was just his copyist. I was the one who would take his handwritten stuff and put it into Finale on the computer and print it out for the orchestra members that night. Um, and I was also playing in the orchestra for that show. This was a summer production at school. And he got to know me really well and got to know my playing really well. And I didn't realize that while we were all there doing this show on campus that summer, he was telling the New York contractor about several of us in the orchestra and several of us got hired to play the Les Mis tour then. So this was summer of 2010. I was supposed to be starting my master's degree then in the fall at Northwestern um, and out of the blue got a phone call from Michael Keller, who's a contractor here in New York, um, offering me the job. More on the Broadway lingo. Again, we can talk in detail about this later. A contractor is the person who hires the orchestra. So it's a little similar for those who are more familiar with like the classical world. You know, there's like an orchestra manager or a personnel manager. Um, and I, I'm sure many, actually many of your youth symphonies probably have something very similar. And that's the person who, you know, deals with getting the music to everybody, doing all the logistics and also you know, sort of deals with like who, you know, the hiring process and in musical theater, that person is the um, contractor. So the contractor is the one that deals with all of the processes of, you know, getting the the band put together, dealing with the pit set up, dealing with the actual contract with the union. There's a whole, all of the like business stuff is what the contractor does. So the contractor was the one who hired me and had gotten my name from the orchestrator. And then before I knew it, November of 2010, I had packed my entire life into two suitcases and showed up at a hotel in New Jersey and started the national tour of Les Mis. Um, so I started as, of all things, I was the violist, um, but because this orchestrator and I had talked so much about conducting, um, the story, this is, it's not even a glamorous story. The thing, the deal with that is like, he would be handwriting his scores and he would call me thinking that he would have them done, thinking that it would take me like, a half hour for me to get to him. And he would call me and be like, oh, I'm here at this restaurant. And I was like, cool, I live next door. And I would show up and sit at the restaurant with him while he was still writing his scores. And so we would just talk while he was handwriting his material. And we would talk about conductors because that was the stuff that I was interested in. And because of our conversations, he told the contractor that I was a great conductor. He didn't see me conduct until five years later after I'd been on the Les Mis tour. For yeah, oh yeah, I'd, I'd been doing Les Mis for five years and he saw me conduct a small chamber concert in New York. But had recommended me as a conductor five years prior to that. Um, so I went on tour as um, the full-time violist and backup emergency cover conductor, which they don't print that in the program. <laughs> um, so I was literally, it was my job to conduct the show like once every six months, which was wild. But I, you know, at that point I was like, this is a dream job. Like, you know, that someone's hiring me to be a conductor. And, you know, and I, I loved musical theater. And I, you know, at that point I was like, look, if you're gonna pay me to play viola, I'll play viola which was great because I sort of fell back in love with the instrument, doing something that I loved doing, right? I was sort of burnt out in the school scene um, because, you know, I really committed hard to what I needed to do to really get myself to grow as a player. Uh, and then I got hired to do musical theater and suddenly fell back in love with the viola because I realized the thing that I really loved doing was playing shows. Right. And so when I was playing shows eight nights a week, then I could do the things you don't love doing as much. Right. You know, I could play the the exercises and the scales and the etudes that maybe aren't as fun, but I knew were going to set me up to be able to play the show really well that night. Um, and I fell back in love with the instrument. So I did the Les Mis tour for three years. Um, 85 cities. We were in a different city every week. Um, 
you know, I think, yeah, three years. And then when the Lamas tour was about to close, I was going to go back to Northwestern to get my master's degree finally in conducting. And they called me and they were like, actually, we need you to go to Canada. We need you to, to do the Canadian production in Toronto for six months as the violist and associate conductor. You'll conduct once a week. And I was like, cool, great. Also like, great, I'll live out of the country for six months. How wonderful. Um, and I also knew at that time that they had announced the Broadway production. And I was like, I have a feeling this is them. They're trying. This is my trial. They're testing me out to see if this could work for New York. Um, but I also went into that knowing that I have the type of brain that if I think they're testing me out for this, I'm not going to be able to focus on anything else, and it's going to be a mess. So I deliberately was like, you know what? Go in there and do a good job. Just do your thing. Do the show as you know it. Go enjoy living in Canada. Love your time there and let things happen as they're going to happen. And two weeks into the rehearsal process, they were like, so Broadway's opening in six months. Do you want the job? Um, and so they hired me to play viola and I was the viola and second assistant conductor on the Broadway production of Les Mis. By this point, we can talk more about this later too. Was I sick of Les Mis? 10,000% yes. I love Les Mis, don't get me wrong. Absolutely love the show. But when you have played it eight times a week for by this point, three and a half years, and you know that you're about to go to New York and do it for at least another year, if not more, I was like, okay, I have to be in the right headspace to pull this off and to do this well. And I understood that it was my stepping stone into New York. I understood that I was really coming into a scene that is competitive. And I was coming in with a show that I knew backwards and forwards. So I was like, I'm coming in knowing that I can show off my best work the moment I walk in the door. Um, and I did Lamez for another year and a half. And thankfully, some connections led then to Fiddler on the Roof. I did Fiddler. Then I moved when Fiddler closed, the same team that was had done Les Mis was doing Miss Saigon. So I bounced back to Miss Saigon. The same team that had done Fiddler was doing My Fair Lady. So when Miss Saigon closed, I bounced to My Fair Lady. And then um, shortly into My Fair Lady, the team that had done Saigon by that point, um, the associate conductor on Miss Saigon, you know, is married and has a house upstate and several dogs and was like, I don't want to go on the road. And I knew it. I, he's a good friend of mine. And I was like, I know he's not going to want to take this tour out. And by chain of command, it should fall to me, which is a weird thing because I'm not a pianist first, despite the fact that it's behind me. I'm not a pianist first. I do play, but like not on the Broadway scale and not the piano vocal score of Miss Saigon, which is extremely difficult. And most music directors are pianists. And I was like, you know, in terms of the chain of command, I should get this show, but I'm not the, the typical candidate for this. And um, the music director uh, really believed in me and sent me out on the road as a music director of Saigon. So I was then conducting Miss Saigon, you know, eight times a week, um, literally up until COVID hit. Um, we were actually one of the last shows standing um, only because we were in Florida at the time. Um, and, you know, Florida was not shutting anything down. So we were still out there doing our thing. Um, but yeah, that was sort of, that's like the overview of my trajectory, um, how I ended up going from college straight into a show um, and just like rode that show all the way to, to New York um, and then just sort of used a few small connections to just sort of bounce between things at that point. Um, yeah, so that's my journey from central Pennsylvania um, to New York City. Uh, I really love to talk about that because I really would love, and, and again, if you have specific questions about this, we'll have time for this at the end. I, I really, when I was growing up in central Pennsylvania, like, a, you know, here, like an honest moment, I really believed that because I was in central PA and not in Philly or Pittsburgh, that I was at a severe disadvantage, you know, because like I would go to these PMEA festivals and I'd look at these Philadelphia string players and be like, wow, I can't play like that. You know, these kids who were all at like Curtis pre-college and I was like, I can't, I, I can't do that. You know, kids that were taking the train to New York City to go to Juilliard and Manus pre-college, like I didn't play that way because I had a ton of interests and like, you know, my parents were busy and like, you know, we also traveled a lot as a family. So my parents were like, we love your music career, but also we love our family time. So I really felt like I was in a disadvantage and I was really worried that I was going to be behind in the music world. Um, and the biggest thing for me coming out of central Pennsylvania is I have a really, really distinct understanding of how to make music engaging and how to make music accessible because I'm coming from an area of the country that to me feels like very grounded. Um, and my experience is that I didn't get trained in these like super, I wasn't trained in the ivory tower, right? I wasn't trained in these institutions that have been around for years and years and years. I was trained by real people on the ground doing music, um, you know, in real ways. Uh, and I 
again, was very nervous about that, even into college. And even I was nervous that I wasn't going to be, you know, good enough because I would get to Northwestern and I was like with these people that had like been principal viola of the Boston Youth Symphony and had like studied in LA with, and I was like, I didn't do that. You know, I was like, I studied with a teacher in the Harrisburg Symphony and I felt behind, also felt behind because I did a thousand things in high school, but then I learned very quickly what I had to do to catch up and I did. Eric worked extremely hard, did what my teacher told me to do. And like the beauty is that like the people at Northwestern saw um, a great deal of potential in me and saw a great deal of understanding. Um, and I think part of the reason why I fell so hard into musical theater is a little bit of my Central Pennsylvania background as well, because it's so important for me, it's so important to me that music is accessible, that like I'm not presenting music to try to soar over your head, right? I'm presenting music so that you the audience connect with it, you connect with me and that you see me connect with music so that you then connect with it as well. Right. And no matter what the genre is, like, that's what's very important to me. And it was sort of my central Pennsylvania upbringing that really did that for me. Um, and again, I love to share my story with particularly central Pennsylvania students because I love to be able to show you that it's possible. Right. That it's that you don't have to have grown up in New York City, in Philadelphia, you know, in these big what have been traditionally the big music hubs, you don't have to have grown up there to have a successful career as an artist. Um, especially not now, right? You have technology at your fingertips. We'll talk more on that later. Um, great. I sort of ended up combining my journey from high school with my Broadway journey. Um, if you have more questions specifically about that, we'll get to it in a second. I want to address sort of how Broadway pits work first before we jump into some questions. Is that cool? I've got, I'm going to, I got put on pin. Great, great. Um, amazing, amazing. Great. You know, the whole way you're like, you guys have all been on Zoom forever. You understand how this works. The weird thing about Zoom is you can't like <laughs> judge the vibe of the room. But like, we've, I've been there. I get I understand how this all works. Great. All right. So let's talk a little bit about how Broadway pits work because they are slightly different than classical music or than even like the youth symphony orchestras that you're currently playing in now. Um, big difference number one there is no audition. Like if you want to go win a job in the New York Phil, you look in the union paper or look online and when they post that they have a second violin opening, you learn the excerpt, drive yourself crazy learning those excerpts, perfect, and you walk in and you and a thousand other violinists play the same excerpt behind a screen and, you know, the person that they like the most wins. That person gets the job. Musical theater doesn't work that way. We have no audition. There's no space that it's not like they post in the union magazine oh mrs doubtfire is coming to broadway and you know we need a violist that doesn't happen um the only thing that does post is uh radio city so the radio city christmas show every year is the only thing that actually posts an audition notice and you all everyone sends in their resume and it's a total crapshoot as to who gets it and who does it i have colleagues that have been playing broadway shows for 20 years and one year they'll get an audition and the next year they won't and I have people that have like never, ever played a Broadway show ever who walk in and win the job. So Radio City is a total gamble. Um, there have been years, my, my first year in New York, where I walk, I was on a chair and I knew the music director, didn't get an audition. Um, second year, the year after that, I did. Um, you know, so it's all, that's the only thing that has an audition, but nothing else does. So for us as musical theater players, it is about the connections that we make and it's about the community that we build. Um, and I don't know if this still exists. When I was growing up, the New York theater community was uh stereotypically talked of as being jaded and competitive and harsh and i'm here to tell you that i have not experienced any of that sure there are maybe one or two people that that fit that right but there's those people everywhere but on the whole which for the string players out there i think you may understand too how remarkable this is the string playing community in new york city is extremely warm very helpful, very kind. You know, we're string players, so we don't talk to each other for the first like two months until we like really, really get to know each other. And then it's a beautiful community. Um, look, I mean, that's how we are, right? We, we're, there's something like quiet and, and introverted and sort of weirdly competitive about all of us. Um, but the the string playing community to me in New York when I first arrived, they were not, they were never mean. They weren't like trying to trip me up. They weren't trying to um, undermine my ability. They, again, were a little like cautious, basically just trying to be like, who are you? How do you fit in here? And then within two months, we were all very close and very good friends. And I, and now still like years later, like absolutely wonderful, wonderful people. Um, I really find that my colleagues in shows are some of the most inspirational people that I get to work with, which is a really special experience, right? So 
the beauty about New York is because it is so connections based, our community is so important. Um, so the big question is like, how do you get a show, right? And there's a thousand paths to that because there's no audition. So you can get into a show by knowing the contractor, by knowing the music director, by knowing the assistant or the associate conductor, by knowing the music supervisor. So in a show, there's the music supervisor who generally does not conduct. This is the person that sits out in the auditorium during the you know rehearsal process and figures out what needs to happen and has their fingers in everything, has their fingers in the orchestra, has their fingers in the cast, has their fingers in the, um, the orchestrations, the arrangements, has their fingers in the dance music, all of it. Then there's the music director, who is usually the conductor. It's usually the same person, not always, but generally speaking, the music director and the conductor are the same person. And they're the ones who are doing the actual like rehearsing of the cast and the rehearsing of the orchestra. And they're the ones who are going to conduct the show seven times a week, and their associate will conduct once. Um, and then you have the associate conductor and the assistant conductor after that. The associate or the assistant is also generally the rehearsal pianist. Sometimes there's an extra rehearsal pianist brought in, depending on how we need to split the rooms up to get the most effectiveness out of the rehearsal time. Because unlike where you are now as high school players, as professionals, time is money. So rehearsal is very expensive, which is a very complicated thing, right? Because there's a beauty in having all the rehearsal time in the world. You can really dig into a piece. And in the professional setting, rehearsals are fast because they have to be, right? So there's an expectation that you show up really, really prepared because there's no time to help you work through your parts. You gotta figure out on the fly how you fit into everybody around you and how you fit into the stage. And it's like, because again, you just don't have, there's, it's, you know, if you have 20 people in your orchestra, it's a big, or if you have a 20 person orchestra, you know, each of those people are getting paid 65, $70 an hour. And then you multiply that by an eight hour day. It's a lot of money per day to have an orchestra in there. Um, so, it's really like a time is money situation, but to get into a show, you can know any of those people. You also could know the copyist, the orchestrator. Um, in some cases, I know people that have gotten in because they've known the director, they've known the choreographer, they've known the dance arranger. In other cases, you get in because you know one of the other players. So say it's a big string show and the music director has a really good relationship with the um, concert master. They will hire the concert master first and then the concert master will sit down with the music director and the, con the contractor and figure out who they want to hire. So they'll sit down and say, you know, I really like so-and-so and so-and-so in my string section. And the music director might say, well, great, I like them, but I also want this person in here. And the contractor might say, I don't like this person, or I'm already putting them on this other show. Let's put someone else in there. And it's a big like puzzle to figure out how that all gets in, right? So it's all connections. You can get into the Broadway scene by subbing. So when you go to a show, you should understand that, and this is the beauty of New York theater, Generally speaking, probably half of that orchestra are not the regular players that are listed in the playbill. Um, because we as theater players can sub out up to 50% of our shows and still keep the job. Now, I only get paid for the shows that I play. So if I play four shows that week, I don't get paid for eight. It's not that cushy. Um, I can only get paid for four. But if but that means that if I We'll use a different colleague because it doesn't happen to me yet. But um, I have a, uh, a colleague who's a horn player and uh, frequently subs at the Metropolitan Opera. Um, so like, and that really blew my mind. My, 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 it was like my first or second week on Les Mis and he had been gone for a few days and he came back and I was like, oh, hey, Pat, like, where were you? And he, and, cause I knew he was on a gig and I like wanted to know what he was. And he was like, oh yeah, I was playing La Boheme at the Met. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that must've been fine. I didn't know what to say. I was like, what do I say to a colleague who casually is playing with what I think is one of the best orchestras in the country, you know? And I was like, oh, Okay, <laughs> sure, you know, and like that's it's here's the crazy thing. I mean, the, the where I, I teach right now, I teach violin and viola at a private school in New Jersey, just over the bridge from my apartment. And the band director there is like a big time Broadway trumpet player, also subs in everything at the Met. He's he's a he's the trumpet player and plays in the Met all the time, all the time. And he like you know I see him every day like wrangling third graders, you know, but like at night in, in the real world, when we're not in the pandemic, he's like playing at the Met. He also was like the head of the trumpet department at NYU. Like, so the, like, there's just so much crossover here in the city, um, but it's that. So we can sub out up to 50% and still keep our chairs. So if I get a gig that is either interesting to me or pays more money, or you know, it, it allows me to stay fresh in the show, I can sub out and I choose my subs. So the contractor doesn't, the, the music director, the contractor, they can step in and say, you know, hey, I'd love if, 
you know, if so-and-so um, came in and played, I'd love if this person came in. I don't do that to my music, to my orchestras because I don't love it when music directors do it to me because my sub list is very specific. Um, so like I get to pick my subs. I get to pick the five people that come in and sub for me, um, which is the way that you get to know people in the Broadway scene. That's how you get to be known in the Broadway scene. So like one of my subs, um, Molly, is, you know, Juilliard grad, wonderful violist. Um, I Molly subs for me and Molly has gotten me teaching jobs. Um, so like the schools that I teach at have come from Molly and the shows that Molly has on, been on have come from me. Um, but like Molly broke into the Broadway scene and is now like established in the Broadway scene because of her subbing through me. Um, and so that's really the way to break in. The biggest way is really to sub with people. So I know a lot of people who went to school in New York, who like came to New York for a master's degree. Um, yeah, usually a master's degree uh, and, or an undergrad and their teacher played on Broadway and the teacher really loved them. So the teacher would give them the opportunity to sub on the show um, or would connect them with someone else to sub on the show. So subbing is really a big way um, to get in to shows. But I think that I love pointing out that we can take off up to half of the shows in the week and still keep the job. Um, Cause I think people don't realize how much variety there really is happening in Broadway pits. Um, it's also what has made the freelance scene in New York so rich, right? Because this wasn't always the case. This kind of became a thing in like the 60s or 70s and everything prior to that, the orchestra was part of the theater. So like the Imperial Theater on 46th, 45th Street had its own orchestra. And that worked during the golden age of musical theater, but that became problematic when like, Annie Get Your Gun would play and then the next show in there was Dream Girls. And like, those are two completely different orchestras. And then the, the show after that would be Pippin. And like the, that requires three different bands. So they basically, they got rid of this house orchestra idea, um, but introduced the subbing idea so we could have a much richer um, freelance scene in New York. Um, and it's a beautiful thing because it actually keeps the community really tight because it means that like, while you're not on a show, the people who are on shows will pull you in to sub for them and vice versa. Then you pull in the people who aren't on shows. Um, so it's a beautiful sort of like rotating. I, I talk about it like it's a pool, like, like, you know, at the, you know, like at the, like the public pool, like there's like a moment in the, in the, um, the, the adult swim moment where like all the kids have to get out of the pool. Like, it feels like you're at the pool where the people in the pool are the people working and the people outside the pool are the people aren't working, but you can get in and out of the pool throughout the experience. That's very much how the theater scene is here in New York. <clears throat> all right. Pull up my notes for a second. Great. So I want you to imagine that you you're in a Broadway show. Um, I don't know if any of you. I'm sure some of you have played theater at your high school. Um, knowing what Hershey High School's pit looks like, I want you to imagine that pit orchestra that you're in for your show, and um, cut it in half, and cut it in half again, and don't take any of the people out. Um, that, so that's the orchestra, that's the pit that you're in for the run of the show, and you've been there for 30 years next to the same people. You haven't changed chairs, it, no one's graduated, it's like it's, you all just aged together, staying in your same seats. That's what, play, that's what playing a Broadway show is like. So the number one thing that, the number one thing of importance for musical theater players is being a good colleague, being a good person, being kind to those around you because you're gonna sit with them for a long time. Maybe your show only runs six months, which is disappointing because you know then you you're sort of out of a job. But like, maybe you're on Phantom and it runs for thirty years. You're next to the same people for thirty years. Sure, they sub out every now and then, but you have to maintain a collegial relationship, and that's I think the biggest thing about being a theater player, about being a musician in New York, is about being a good colleague. And the people that get work in New York are great players, and probably better people. Right? There are definitely violists in New York who are better than me who have better technique, who play with better intonation, who have better bow control, but they don't mesh or blend into the ensemble in the same way that I do. They don't bring the same energy um, that I do to a show. And I think that's the biggest thing about musical theater playing. Honestly, that's the biggest thing about being a human, really, like to be a good person and really pref like prioritize being a good person in the same way that you prioritize your skill set in the same way that you prioritize doing your scales and doing your etudes and being great on your instrument or being great at this applies to really anything. If you choose to go, if you choose a non-musical path, being great at whatever craft you're choosing, 
put the same amount of effort that you do into that as you do into developing yourself as a person because that collegial relationship is so important and we just use pit orchestras as a great example because you're trapped in the same little space together and tour is another example of that right you're on the road with the same 80 people and that's the only 80 people that you get to know they are your friends and your co-workers because it's hard to make friends in a city when you're there for a week right so this idea of being a good colleague is so so important um Let's see. Great. I want to take a moment now and open it up for questions because I've sort of like I've talked at you for a long time. I'm going to keep my eye on the clock because I will reserve a little bit of time to play at some point at the end and can also chat more about sort of the like conducting viola balance. But um, are there questions right now about this experience, about playing music on Broadway, about how I got from high school to college to um, New York, anything? You can also type it in the chat if you are not wanting to jump in, because um, I can see the chat at this point, taking myself off of full screen view. <laughs> great. Oh, there. Wow. Here they are. Okay. Great. Um, great. I'll start with. Okay. So starting with Nora. I mentioned that I had multiple interests in high school. How, okay. So Nora's asking. I mentioned that I had multiple interests in high school. How did I decide to focus on viola and conducting? Great question. Um, sorry, Dr. Campbell, for my answer in this. Um, I So I went to Pennsylvania Governor's School on the trumpet. Um, thanks to Dr. Campbell um, and his teaching. I still remember Charlier number two. Um, I used to mess with my trumpet player on tour all the time um, and would like play it in my dressing room so that he could hear. I played on my viola so that he could hear it and it would make really mess with his head. Um, I So I went to Governor's School on trumpet. I uh, really thought I was going to be a trumpet player. Trust me, my high school band director, everybody was shocked when I didn't pick the trumpet. And I honestly didn't, it, my not choosing trumpet had nothing to do with my experience around playing the trumpet. In fact, I, I think I had an amazing experience through like all of my trumpet experiences in high school were actually probably a lot of the ones that really, really cemented um, me as a conductor um, and really changed the way that I played the viola. Um, my mother used to joke that I play viola like a trumpet player and I do, um, but I, picked viola because I was at governor school on trumpet and I was ended up spending most of my time playing viola because I didn't like having to pace myself as a brass player. I didn't like the fact that if I went too hard, I wasn't able to play for the rest of the day. Um, I, that, I, that was the biggest thing for me. And I didn't like that it like hurt my face and that I couldn't just like tear into what I wanted. Now, I learned very quickly that you can't just tear into the viola either because then your back hurts for the rest of the day. But different story, but I, I really ended up picking the viola because I felt that I just connected with it in a different way. And I'm really glad that I did because viola is what gave me the chance to conduct on Broadway because the viola is the least offensive instrument to come in and jump into because that nobody would have hired me as a, first of all, no one would have hired me as a trumpet conductor because you can't lose your trumpet player in a show. In an emergency, you can't lose your trumpet player. In an emergency, you can lose the viola. And that's happened many times. I've been mid-show and have had to put down my viola and get up and conduct the show. And honestly, it's not the end of the world. Yes, things are missing. You're missing that like really special like glue in the middle of it. But to the audience, you're going to miss that first trumpet a lot more than you're going to miss the viola. So that allowed me to be into that position. Also, again, jumping into the musical theater scene in New York, having not been a part of the scene for a long time and not done the subbing thing, jumping in as second viola was so much less offensive. I was literally the bottom of the totem pole. It was like second viola, second horn. Like it was the two of us sitting there in the bottom. I, they wouldn't have brought me in as a trumpet player because there are just too many really great trumpeters in New York. Um, and it's a much more high profile position. They wouldn't have been willing to take a risk on me where they were willing to take a risk on me as the violist um, because it was more hidden in the ensemble. Um, so that was a little, that was a little bit of it. And the conducting thing, like sometimes with conducting, like when you get the bug, you get the bug. And I just like, I, I couldn't at the time, I couldn't verbalize what I loved about it. I just started doing it. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I have to do this all the time. It was just that for me. You know, sometimes that happens to people. Like when you just find that thing that speaks to your soul, it just does. And that was conducting for me. Um, I mean, like, let's be clear. My first ensemble that I conducted was a middle school bell choir at my church. And honestly, like, I don't look back bad. I loved that. I loved those kids. I learned that we could only do things in 4-4. Four, four. We couldn't do 3-4. That was too hard. That was very confusing. But I loved those kids so much. 
And it was like such a such a small thing, but like that was conducting really spoke to me. All right, next one. Highest level of PMEA festival that I went to. Oh, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, real talk, I didn't get into PMEA districts until my junior year on either instrument, trumpet or viola or singing. I didn't get into districts until my junior year. Um, so don't think that because you haven't gotten in that you therefore won't have a music career. It was, it, it took me a while to get in. I did go to States um, my junior year um, on viola and my senior year on viola as well. Um, I didn't get to do the all Eastern thing because that I was like in the off year of that. Um, uh, but I, yeah, so States were the high, was the highest level that I went to. Um, the crazy thing is my stand partner for regionals and states junior year was the same stand partner I had for regionals and states my senior year as well. Um, he's a professional violist living in Austin. Um, so yeah, states was the highest that I went to. Does it help to play in local theaters or does it not make a difference? For your resume, I mean, but the people don't look at your resume in New York. Does it help to play in local theaters? 10,000% because how are you gonna, that's how you learn to play shows. That's how you learn how you fit into a theater experience, right? Because you want to have the experience that when you get to New York or Chicago or LA or wherever you want to play theater, when you get there, you don't want to be worried about how to play theater. You want to be focused on all of the other things, on how to fit in with your colleagues, on how to play like them, on how to adjust your playing to really blend into the group. You don't want to think about what does this vamp mean? How do I get out of this? What do they mean by a scene change? What does segue mean at the end of this? What do I wear? Like, you don't want to have to think about all of those things. You want to already have the context. So my thing is like get experience whenever, wherever you can get experience, anywhere. Do I have any funny stories um, from the pit? Oh, absolutely. I was just talking about this last night. Um, there was a day in Miss Saigon and she won't mind that I'm telling the story because she's a good friend. Um, we had a trombone sub who ended up being my trombone player on the tour. And it was like her third or fourth time playing the show. And we were in the middle of like a really beautiful, like quiet section and the brass was doing these like beautiful chords. And she sneezed into her trombone in the middle of a chord. And she's one of the loudest trombone players I've ever heard. Beautiful sound, so loud. And we're in the middle of this quiet thing and we just hear this like, ah! all of us staring at the floor. We were laughing so hard. Um, and let's be clear, as a string player, like, pull up my instrument so you can see, my microphone is here, like inches from my face. So I can't laugh out loud while this is happening. Horrible, amazing moments. Um, I'm trying to think there's there are like mishaps that have happened on stage, you know, there's like all funny things like that. I had the horrible thing when I was conducting Les Mis once at the Kennedy Center in DC at the Opera House, where I gave a cue wrong at the end of the show after like to love another person is to see the face of God and the ensemble comes in off stage with the reprise of do you hear the people sing? they came in and around and sang it one beat apart from each other for like a solid eight bars and I was like. I can't fix this and we're in like one of the biggest venues in the country. Um, so, you know, things like that happen. Uh, whew, how has COVID changed Broadway? Do you think COVID will have any lasting effects on the way Broadway will function? Um, yes. Uh, COVID obviously has completely eliminated musical theater. Um, and the complicated thing about Broadway is it just costs so much money to get a show up and running again. So, you know, it's going to be a long time. I think if we're going to like real talk, I think it's going to be like four or five years till the industry gets back up to the, the level that it was at. Um, nobody really knows what will happen. No one knows whether the type of tourism that sustained Broadway before will when that will return to New York City. Um, and the city's cultural life really does depend on that. Um, you know, I think it's also a question of like, you know, how is it's a question of the vaccine availability and prevalence. Um, it's a question of, again, when people will start returning to the city, when all that will happen. I think what you will see, though, is a lot of smaller theaters, regional theaters, um, tours start going back first. So in terms of like Broadway, Broadway, as in the shows between 40th and 52nd Street um, in New York City, that will be the last thing to come back um, because of just the amount of money required to really get those up and running. Um, I think the lasting effects that you may see on Broadway is you may see a bunch of smaller um, new shows pop up because they're going to have smaller budgets. And I, I, that excites me a little bit. You know, I think you're going to see things like that. Um, I have no idea how it will affect the culture of Broadway. Honestly, I hope it brings a little more gratitude to it. I hope we sort of realize that it's just really special to get to do what we do now that it's not, doesn't exist. Um, hard to say, but it's going to be a while until things really start to come back to normal. But again, I think you'll start seeing it on the smaller level before you're going to start seeing it up where we are. 
uh, biggest challenge in college with practicing? <laughs> what was it experiencing the burnout towards the end? Um, my, I mean, my biggest challenge in college with practicing was I had like 8,000 interests. And um, did I want to play Shraddock in my practice room? Absolutely not. Um, but I knew it was good for me. So I would like go and do that. My other thing too is that like, you know, the hardest thing with practicing was playing repertoire that I may not necessarily have like loved. Um, but you don't always get to play everything you love all the time, right? And it's funny when I got to play shows, I never felt like I had to practice them because I, of course I was practicing them, but they were fun. It was exciting. And I always wanted to do that. And like, when I get a show, when I get a new book for a show, I like devour it. You know, when I get a new score that I'm learning, I devour it. I will sit in silence in my apartment and like, just like absorb everything out of the score. Um, the burnout for me at school was that I really was trying to fit into the classical music stereotype that I thought existed, which is not necessarily what it exists, but I was trying to fit into this like exclusive elitist idea of classical music and was really not giving attention to my needs to be sort of engaging and accessible. Um, so that's when the burnout happened. I was just like not being true to myself, honestly, um, which can sneak up on you. I also didn't know how to articulate that at that age. Um, so that's when the burnout happened and I was burnt out on viola, but not on conducting. I was like devouring as much conducting stuff as I could. I was just like kind of done with the viola thing. Um, which again, as I said, when I started doing musical theater, I fell back in love with the instrument, um, which has allowed me to actually pursue a lot of classical. I, mean, I have a recital on Zoom tomorrow night, actually, tomorrow afternoon of classical music that I love. It's, it's all music that I've picked that I think is gorgeous. Um, and so like, it's not that I don't like classical music, it's just that I've learned how to do classical music now on my terms. Um, where with theater, I'm actually happy to do it on other people's terms because I just like the genre so much more. Um, not saying that either is better or worse, it's just my personal taste and preference. Um, one of the most important things to focus on when playing in a pit orchestra, um, knowing the difference between when you are part of the ensemble and when you have to stand out and knowing how you fit into the texture of the whole story. Because remember in theater, it's not like an orchestra concert where the orchestra concert is strictly about the music. This is about the storytelling. You as a musician are part of an entity, which is part of the storytelling, which is what I love about theater. It's so much more about collaboration. So as a pit orchestra player, you have to have an awareness, not only of the players around you, but also of what's happening on the stage and how you fit into that. Which can be difficult, right? If you're in a, if you're in a different room, if you're someplace where you can't see the stage, you know, and you have to sort of take your cues from the music director or from what you're hearing um, to know how you fit in. But also knowing that you're not always an accompaniment, right? Sometimes you're an accompaniment. Sometimes you are a, you're underscoring where there's like a dialogue scene happening and you're the music underneath it, which is you're even softer. And sometimes you're the full feature. And I think as the violist in musical theater, you know, my life is so much about figuring out. Am I the violist right now? Am I the second violin right now? Am I the cellist right now? Am I coloring the horn right now? Do I have a solo right now? Like that kind of thing. Really knowing that like my levels are constantly adjusting, that I'm never just playing one line. I'm constantly thinking about, oh, okay, so for these two bars, I'm 100% like the boom chicks. And then for these two beats, I have something interesting and now I'm out of the texture again. It's really about knowing how to like assert yourself and then blend into the background. Um, and that just comes with just experience, just doing it, which is it's the question earlier, you know, should you work in local theaters? Yes, right? Because that not getting paid to work at your community theater is a perfect place for you to experiment with that in a lower stakes environment, right? And the stakes where no, they're not going to fire you if you play a wrong note, they might not be happy, but it's your chance to really play with that and figure out how you fit. Um, currently watching two people write music for Bridge on the Musical. What's the process of getting a Broadway show onto the stage? Oh, I skipped one. I'll go back to the catch up one too. Okay. Um, process of getting a Broadway musical to the stage. <laughs> uh, you write it and then you like workshop it with your like close friends so you can hear it. You like do, you know, table reads, like literally in an apartment around a piano and you just like get the scenes on their feet so you can start seeing how the like energy actually works between the people then that moves to like a workshop or a lab um, where you're hiring people to come in and interpret the material again minimal costumes probably no set but there's some staging some choreography you're going to start seeing some things happen maybe it's like a piano based drums in the room but you, you know if the show has an instrument that's really featured you might have that one instrument but there's not a lot of them there's not a lot of musicians in that space then it moves to either a regional theater. Um, so there's a lot of regional theaters that do new works, Good Speed Opera House in Connecticut, um, 
like Guthrie out in uh, Minnesota, um, you know, those like regional theaters, um, what's the one, La Jolla in um, uh, California. They, there's a lot of theaters that do new work specifically to help them get up off the ground, or a lot of universities do that as well. So you take it to one of those places. Then you do your out of town. So you're gonna do it in Chicago, in Denver, in DC. Um, historically, they were always done in New Haven. I don't know why they don't do them there anymore much, but you do an out of town production. You do the full show in a less critical market than New York, right? You do it in a place where the critics aren't gonna rip you apart. And if you get bad reviews and you're out of town, then you tweak all of the things you need to do. Maybe you do another lab in New York, something, and then it moves to Broadway. This is like a 10 year process often to get shows. There are shows that fast track it. It depends. Um, I know shows that have opened straight on Broadway and have had great success and some that have opened straight on Broadway and been terrible. And you look at it and you're like, you would have done so much better with an out of town to see all of these errors. Um, so it's a long process like that. I skipped one. How were I able to catch up with my viola? How, okay, this is the question of how was I able to catch up with my viola performance in college and what was the most successful, what was the most successful help for that? Um, I mean, it was hours in the practice, it was time, time in the practice room. I practiced four hours a day my freshman year. That dwindled <laughs> as I went along, but I practiced four hours a day my freshman year. I got to the practice room at, I would get up at six, I'd be in the dining hall by 6.45, and I would be in the practice room by seven, and I had class at 10. So I would get two hours of practicing in in the morning before my first class started. And it was grueling. It wasn't great, but that's the work that I had to really put in, and it was stratic. Stratic, 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 stratic. Stratic was such a big thing for me, particularly as violists, where I'm not like a violin situation where I'm really all over the instrument. I'm living most of my life in like first, second, third, and fourth position. Um, that's what we do as violists. That's that's the game. That's the deal. And so like I, Stratic was so helpful for me because it really solidified those positions. Um, you know, scales, etudes. That it was that those kind of things were really really helpful. Um, and then just that's what I loved about Northwestern. Just listening to everyone, listening to your colleagues, and being like how do I make that sound? How do I sound like you? I would hear a colleague and be like, that is the most beautiful viola sound I've ever heard in the world. What do you do to do that? I would ask people questions. I would ask them to give me lessons. Like I literally would go to, a, I, as a freshman, I, I would go to a senior and be like, hey, Kristen, I think you have the most beautiful sound in the world. What strings do you use? What viola do you play on? Can we have a lesson? Can you help me with this? Or you heard me play in studio class last week. What can I do to really make this piece sound like you? That kind of thing. It was a lot of hearing other people and being like, what can I do to sound like you? Um, and to be honest, I've been doing that as a trumpet player long before I was doing it as a violist. I would listen to Wynton Marsalis play all these classical pieces and be like, oh my gosh, um, how can I sound like that? So that, that was the biggest thing for me. Um, and just putting the hours. And also knowing that like, it's a long, it's a, that uphill climb is slow for a long time. And then before you know it, you're like, oh my God, I can play. Like, it's that. You feel like you're not making any progress and then all of a sudden you do. Uh, lots of synths being used on Broadway. Do I think there is still a future for wind players? Um, yes, th that's a whole complicated thing. Orchestras have gotten smaller and smaller. I'm going to say we fight for live music all the time. Um, thankfully, they haven't been able to, like a solo wind part doesn't sound good on a keyboard. It's the section stuff that does. So your solo players will still exist. Um, Yes, somebody asked my email. I'm gonna, I'll put my email in the chat so you guys can all have it. You're welcome to write to me um, and ask me questions directly. I'm totally cool with that. Um, how many people in a Broadway pit? Anywhere from five to 30. If you're, at, if you're playing My Fair Lady at Lincoln Center, there are 30 people in that orchestra and it is glorious. You know, there's like 12 people in the string section. It's amazing. If you're playing Miss Saigon, there's on tour, there's 14. Uh, you know, if you're playing a smaller show, if you're playing Little Shop of Horrors, there's like three, right? So really can run the gamut. Generally not more than 30. Again, it's a money thing. Um, all right. What has helped me with time management? Um, it's not, I journal. I write my like goals for the day. I'm a big journaler. Um, not like, I'm not, I don't sit there and like write out all of my thoughts and feelings that I, I, I'm already good at processing those. Slash that's what my practicing will do later on in the day. Um, but I write a lot of like, you know, my three goals for the day are this, this, and this. At the beginning of every week, rather Sundays, I sit down um, and write down 
all of the, my goals for the week. And then I keep checking in with those goals and things that I want to accomplish um, throughout the week. So that's been, been the big time management thing for me. It's really helped. Um, I also use an app called Asana, A-S-A-N-A. -A -A. It's a free app. It's a great like to-do list thing. I love that. Um, but I write my goals. That's really the biggest thing. Okay. I'm going to type my email and website into the chat. Great way to get in contact with me. And then I'm going to play a little bit because I know I promised I would do that. And we're running out of time. This always happens. I always have a lot to say. Um, all right. Email is that. Website is um, willcreamusic.com. OK. Um, also, for the folks who are, I don't look, you all are younger than me. Maybe you use. Um, I don't know, TikTok more than Instagram. I'm on Instagram a lot. So um, I'm going to put my Instagram handle in there as well because um, I do post a lot of playing on my Instagram. That's sort of my way right now because of COVID to connect. All right. A few minutes left. Okay. We're going to start with um, the, this was a big thing for me. So this was in Les Mis and it's uh, in the Les Mis tour. Uh, I remember being very shocked and surprised that there was this like big, beautiful, iconic viola solo. And spoiler alert, I mean, I think you all know Lame is, but it's right after Eponine dies. She sings Little Fall of Rain. It's gorgeous. It's stunning. It, you know, it's our second big death of the of the night um, from the other female character who gets all the good music. Um, and uh, as they're carrying her body off the stage, there's this viola solo. And I remember being like, oh my God, viola solo in musical theater. Um, so this is, so I'm going to turn a bit on this, but I'm like facing the music stand. Uh, this is what, this is the Eponine death solo. Let me do original sound too, so it comes out better. Okay. Eight bars, six bars, whatever it is. Welcome to Viola Solos on Broadway. Um, let's see. Uh, we used to joke in Les Mis that there is the um, the Les Mis warm up. <laughs> it goes like this. <laughs> You get the story. It's the same magic notes that happen over and over and over again in the show, and they just happen in different keys. So we used to call the Lamez warm up, and we would all, as string players, sit in the pit and do the magic notes over and over again. Um, other viola solos. Um, interestingly, Fiddler on the Roof. Well, if you listen to the Fiddler cast album, um, that's our the 2015 one is our production, and. Um, the only viola solo that you can hear on the album is in the middle of Tevye's monologue. Um, after he decides that each daughter can marry who they want, you get. That's it. Two or three bars of just the viola. <laughs> Done. Um, but the big one that happened, it's not in the album, um, was right before they all pack up their stuff and actually leave Anatevka. There's a beautiful scene where Model and Seidel leave and say goodbye to the family, and it's just me and the accordion, which, let me tell you, tuning with the accordion is a nightmare. Me and the accordion playing this. Just very simple. Again, um, I mean, if we're talking Fiddler, the biggest excerpt, though, really is... Pages, pages of offbeats. Um, I don't want to be little offbeats, though. Um, I, I should have you know that my uh, colleague on Fiddler, um, uh, for those who know the Bridges of Madison County, that album, that opening cello solo, um, was my cellist on Fiddler, and she's such a uh, she's a Broadway legend. Um, and after our first rehearsal, she turned to me and she was like, "You're really good at playing the offbeats." She's like, I don't mean that as like a dig to you as a violist. She was like, you're really good at these. She's like, I've never sat with somebody who's so like aware and plays them so well with me. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> That's not something that I've been complimented on before, but I'll take it. Um, 
So weird, weird things. All right, we've got like two minutes left. Is there like any last minute things that I didn't cover? Any burning questions? Again, you have my email. Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer questions about anything, about you know music life, about theater, all the things. Favorite viola piece or concerto? I'm not gonna lie, I really hate most of the viola concertos. I don't like the Bartok and I, the Walton's probably my favorite concerto. I still don't love it. Um, uh, you know, it's only because I'm playing it right now. I'm sort of in the works of re rehearsing it. I love, um, there's an arrangement of the Rachmaninoff cello sonata for viola and that third movement is just like gorgeous. And it's all about like sinking in and like this big, beautiful sound, which is like what I go for. Um, there's also an arrangement of the Elgar cello concerto that Elgar like signed off on. Lionel Turtis did it, um, I think in the 1900s. That's really great as well. Um, last question, good. What have I been doing now during COVID? Um, if you check out my Instagram, I'm doing a ton of concerts, performances. I've really been exploring the music of black composers, um, really been getting into that. Um, so a lot of stuff there. I also work uh, at a school in New Jersey, um, which I love teaching over there. It's really special. Um, yeah, I'm just sort of like hanging tight and trying to figure out how to make it work. You know, I've been doing some Zoom recitals, which is a new format that I'm working on. Um, and uh, really have actually developed my conducting studio. I'm teaching conducting online um, to some group classes and some individual students, which I really, really love getting to do. It's also my way to really just stay connected in theater. Last one, because I, I can answer this in one word. If I could have picked any other instrument that I haven't played, what would it be? It would be the oboe of all things. All right, again, if you have questions for me, please shoot me emails. Um, DMs on Instagram. I don't use TikTok or whatever the kids are doing these days, so sorry. But, um, you know, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer more questions, you know, through those platforms. Thank you, Mr. Curry, for an absolutely inspiring presentation. It was really nice to uh, see you today and, and to uh, listen to everything that you had to say. Kids, please give him a nice wave. And make sure you record his, uh, his information there. And I know he will talk to you in the future. So thank you, Mr. Curry, very much. Awesome, thank you. You bet.